Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, guys. Hello, my name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Brian. Welcome to Wacky Pod 15 in Las Vegas. Hell yeah, Whoa. right? Uh, Wacky Pod is the Western Area Conference of Young People and Alcoholics Anonymous. I figured that out. Please help me open this meeting with a serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That will not mind be done. <laughs> All right, the topic of this man, panel is making... Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to read somebody else's writing. Um, the topic of this panel meeting is walking through pain and sobriety. And I've now asked uh, Rhino to read a passage from the AA literature related to this topic. Rhino alcoholic? Rhino. All right. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies. For we look, we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. That being so you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Uh, Now I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Diana C. from Oceanside, California. Hi, everybody. My name is Diana. I'm an alcoholic. And um, I'm incredibly nervous about speaking on this panel today. I've um, I've told my story in AA before. This isn't the first time that I've ever spoke, but this is sort of a different experience for me because, um, you know, part of what I was taught in my sobriety is that when I get up at a podium in Alcoholics Anonymous, I share my experience, strength, and hope, and that I share for the newcomer, and that I try to be an example of what this program can do what the, this program has done for my life in a positive way. And, um, you know, part of my story is that I'm really good at showing up and suiting up and looking decent and doing my commitments and, you know, doing what I need to do and looking pretty good on the outside, even when I'm really struggling on the inside. And um, in talking to my sponsor about what, what I need to talk about on this panel, um, because this is a panel about walking through pain sober, you know, and sobriety at times has been an incredibly painful experience for me. And she told me that what I really need to share about, what I need to do, is to be honest about some of the things that have been going on between my ears during my sobriety when, you know, I was still doing what I needed to do, but I was really suffering inside. And what, been in AA, both the good and the not so good. And, um, you know, because I don't talk about those things from the podium very often. But... When I've been able to share those things with other people and I found other people that I could relate to with similar experiences, it's saved my life. So I'm assuming that people are showing up to this panel today because they've had some painful experiences. And if, you know, I can just get up here and and tell the gut level truth about what my experience has been and somebody relates to it, then that's that's what I'm here for. So, um, you know, I'm not going to really talk about my drunk log because that's not really on topic for me, but, um, you know, I got sober when I was 16 years old and, uh, was not my idea by the way. Um, but I drank and I used drugs because I just wanted to make the pain stop. And then I got sober because I just wanted to make the pain stop. And you told me it would, you told me that this was a way to feel better. And I thought, fuck it, I'll give it a shot. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth today, so we'll see. Um, you know, but I, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and in many ways came into the world with a fundamental lack 
of an ability to deal with the feelings associated with life, with a, with a lack of the ability to deal with pain. Um, I, I just couldn't do it. That's why I drank. You know, I was a runner, both metaphorically and literally, when I was, when I was drinking and not when I was using. I literally would, like, run away from situations um, because I just couldn't cope. I just couldn't deal with it. And then I got sober, and I had to feel everything, and that sucked. Um, <laughs> you know, but I came into AA, and... You know, I related so much when I first got sober. I really did. I related so much to what other people were saying, and I just sort of grabbed onto this thing, and I, I, I didn't do everything perfectly. I did a lot of things wrong in early sobriety at 16 years old, but I, but I learned the fundamentals of AA, and I did what I was supposed to do for the most part. And I showed up to meetings, and I took the steps, and I worked with other people, and things got better. Um, you know, but then as I was sober a few years, my life started to take a slightly different trajectory than um, a lot of the people that I had been hanging out with and a lot of the people that, you know, I had sort of gotten sober with and stayed sober with. And it was, you know, some of those things were really good things and some of those things felt like a burden, but like most things in life, they were all, you know, when I got, when I got sober, I had a I, you know, I felt different than other people. It's like everybody in AA hears that story. I felt different. I felt different. We all felt fucking different. You know what I mean? But, you know, that was, I really did. And I, I did not know how to connect to other people. I was really uncomfortable with other people. And I came in to AA and I sort of heard things through the filter of what my experience had been in life. And part of that experience had been you can't count on people. And so when they said things like, you know, no human power can relieve your alcoholism and God is everything or he is nothing and blah, 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 what I heard was, don't count on people. They'll let you down. You better figure this God thing out and just count on that. And, um, you know, I tried that and it worked for a while. And, um, you know, I was dealing with a lot of stuff that I just, I just didn't know anybody else who was dealing with. And I knew how to relate to people based on similar experiences, but I didn't know how to talk about how I was feeling with people. And um, the more different my experience got, the less I related in AA. And the more I just felt like I was alone dealing with what I was dealing with. And I didn't know how to, <clears throat> how to like, communicate with people about this stuff. I didn't know how to connect to another person and really let them know who I was. Because you were all going to let me down eventually, so what was the point? Um, you know, so... I went along and I, I stayed sober and I was just, you know, suiting up and showing up and I would, I would talk to my sponsor and I, I had friends, I had friends that I had had for years, but I still didn't know how to really let them know me and really talk to them about who I was and what was really going on with me. I knew how to pick up the phone and say, you know, I need a meeting and this and that. And I, I felt like a lot of times I was going through the motions, but I was still feeling like crap. And, um, Things were really hard, and there was a lot of times I called my sponsor, and I was crying, and I just said, I don't know how to put one foot in front of the other. And, um, you know, I got a lot of really pragmatic suggestions from my sponsor, like take a nap and eat something. And it sounds ridiculous, but I need to be told how to do those kinds of things. Um, it does Self-care does not come naturally to me, and I needed really pragmatic like simple things to get me through some of these experiences. And part of what I, you know, I'm not really going to talk about specific experiences. And part of the reason for that is because for me, that whole feeling of like standing alone and being different and not being able to relate to other people. I spent so much time in AA when I was struggling and my ass was falling off and coming into meetings and just comparing what I was going through to what other people were going through. And I would sit in meetings and I would hear people share about their quality problems and their, oh, you know, I got mad at another mom in the carpool and I got this and that. And I would just like burn up inside because I, you know, contrary to how I look, I am not a shiny, happy person by nature. I am cynical and I have a bad attitude and I did not have a single piece of color, colored clothing other than black for like 10 years in sobriety. And I... You know, I, that didn't go away for me. That's sort of part of who I am. And, you know, and then I would be in these meetings and then I'd hear somebody share about something that was profound 
and just devastating. And, and one of those things where it was like, oh my God, I can't believe this person is going through that. And then I would get that shot of gratitude. Like, well, okay, at least what I'm going through isn't as bad as that. But I was just constantly comparing. Better or worse? Better or worse? Better or worse? Is my pain more legit than theirs? Am I suffering more than they're suffering? And I would do that. And the reality is that doesn't work for me. It is just more of the same. It's more of me being different than other people. So what I mostly want to talk about is, like I said, what's going, what has been going on between my ears and how, how is, how is this program and my recovery really saved me and what have I really struggled with in going through all these things? And are you distracting me right now? Um, <laughs> so, you know, and I just, I just felt so lonely. So lonely. But again, I know how to show up and I know how to do things and I know how to take an inventory and I know how to look at my part and I know how to clean up my messes and I know how to have commitments and I know how to go to work and how to go to school and all those things. But what I really didn't know was how to be a good friend. And I thought I knew because I knew how to show up for people and I knew how to show up and help somebody move and how to pick up the phone and how to be there for somebody else and all those things. But I didn't know how to let another person know me. And I didn't get why I was lonely. I really didn't. You know, and then I'm doing this like, okay, well, I can't count on other people, so got to count on God, got to count on God. And, you know, I spent all this time in sobriety not really connecting to other people's spiritual experiences. And, you know, we talk, the book talks about a God of our understanding. And, you know, it's, it's, it really is open to whatever you want that to be. But most of what's written in the big book and most of what I heard in meetings where I was going was sort of like God as you understand him within these parameters. And um, there were parameters that just weren't really working for me. And I, and I just wondered, working hard enough, why don't I have the same experience as other people? Why don't I share the comfort that they share? Why don't I find comfort in the words that they find comfort in? Why doesn't it work for me? Am I doing it wrong? Can I stay in AA if I don't, if this doesn't work for me, if I don't buy into this? Um, you know, and I didn't, I didn't talk to people about this stuff because I was afraid of the answer, to be perfectly honest. I was afraid that if I, got honest about who I really was and what worked for me and it looked different than what worked for some other people that I was going to, that I wasn't going to be able to stay, that they were going to tell me you better get it this way or you can't really, or you're not, or you're going to drink. Cause I heard things like God is everything or he is nothing. And I heard things like get, you know, get God or die. And basically, and, and the thing is, you know, as, uh, as an alcoholic, I'm more comfortable being black and white than I am seeing shades of gray. And I think a lot of alcoholics are like that, too. And we jump into, you know, these slogans and these sayings and these things that sound so, you know, like they're really great sound bites. <sighs> but that I, I, I had a hard time connecting with them because I was afraid if, like, it didn't work for me, then I couldn't be here, you know. And so the, so then this whole God thing wasn't working for me, and I don't can't count on people. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. It's awful. And... I was lonely and miserable and, you know, the thing is I, I didn't want to drink because I knew that wasn't going to work for me, but something I'd struggled with through most of my sobriety was thoughts of suicide, you know, because I'm a runner and I want the pain to stop. And if a drink's not going to work, what will? You know, and that didn't go away for me when I got sober and it, and it stayed with me for, you know, off and on throughout my sobriety. And, you know, I've, um, you know, I would sit in meetings and I would just be like, so bitter and frustrated, you know, but I got, but I had commitments and I had sponsees and I had all these things and I was doing what I was supposed to do. And I'm like, what's wrong? Why don't I, why don't I feel it? And, and, um, you know, I had to get to the point where I really started letting people know me and know who I am and see my pain. And when I started letting those people in, I did find out that I am not the only one who has ever felt like that. What a Freaking revelation, you know what I mean? I am not completely unique. Um, and, and I started to sort of redevelop friendships with people I'd had, I'd been friends with for years and also, you know, forming new friendships and, and sort of gaining this network of people that I felt like really, really knew who I was and loved me no matter what. And it didn't matter 
that we hadn't been through the same things or had shared experiences. They could know who I was and love me anyway, and I could share with them what my experience was. I could, what a revelation. I could actually like communicate to them what my experience was, and they could be loving and understanding and all those things without having gone through it themselves. And that may sound really simple to you, but that was very, that was a very new concept for me. Because we come into AA and it's like, okay, find some, find somebody who tells your story. Find somebody you can relate to and all that stuff. I didn't know what to do. Um, you know, and I, you know, I, the last few years, I've been through some seriously painful stuff. You know, and part of what happens in AA, part of what the magic of what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous is, you know, we create all this wreckage in our lives when we're drinking. And we come into AA and the big book talks about this and it's, it's wonderful. We come in. And we connect with another alcoholic who has no vested interest in the outcome of what happens to us. Um, our sponsor doesn't care if we pay our bills or stay sober or whatever. Um, it's, you know, because our, our, our family and our relationships and our, you know, our employers and all these people who are like all invested and we've created all this wreckage with, they can't help us because we feel too awful and guilty when we face them. So we come into AA and there's all these people and they don't really give a crap. And it, <laughs> and it makes it easy to be honest and it makes it easier to work with them and it makes it easier to hear what they have to say. Um, but you stay sober for a while and all of a sudden we become each other's family and each other's relationships and each other's friends and each other's employers and are each other's committee members. For any of you who have ever served on a YPAW committee, you know what I'm talking about. And we're no longer these unattached, uninvolved individuals. And if you stay sober long enough, you will be both the casualty and the cause of another person's wreckage in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can guarantee you that. And what happens when that happens? Where do we go? What do we do? What happens when your home group is no longer a comfortable place for you to be? And if, and if anybody's had that kind of experience, I can relate to that because I have. You know, <clears throat> I've, I've found Alcoholics Anonymous to be an unsafe place for me to be honest. And, um, you know, I've been... I've been probably the most lonely in Alcoholics Anonymous when I've been the most active in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that sounds a little bit um, strange, but I was, you know, I was heavily involved in a young people's committee and I was just like my whole life almost. I would like get up and go to work and then I'd basically do AA service work for the rest of it. And I was around through some some really difficult stuff and I'm I was so angry and I was so bitter and I would call my, I was meeting with my sponsor weekly and I was crying all the time and I was so lonely and I was like, I can't talk about this. Because the thing is, I was taught early on that you do not use an AA podium and you do not use an AA meeting as a place to character assassinate other people. And you don't get up and you don't use it as a, as a place to like spill your guts and spill your crap when it's going to affect another person. And, um, you know, but that make, that made it difficult for me to feel like I could be honest because when, if anybody's ever been through that, that experience where you're just like suffering and you're at like some big social meeting and people are all walking, hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? And you're like, okay, I'm totally uncomfortable lying. I don't want to be like, I am great, but I'm not going to go into like all the crap that I'm going through because it's not really appropriate. So you kind of go, eh, you know, what do you say? You know? Um, and I had to do that for a really long time. But at that point, you know, what saved my life was the relationships I had built with people in Alcoholics Anonymous, with women in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, because I had let them really start to get to know who I was. And I had really started to let myself need them. And that was terrifying to, to look out and say, I need these people, because the truth is, you know, we are all fallible and we are all people and there will be days when someone doesn't pick up the phone and there will be days when someone's too self-absorbed to be able to listen to you and like all that stuff happens. But collectively, this network of people that I had come to need has not failed me since I have opened myself up to that. And the truth for me today is that I never have to walk alone through anything ever. And, um, you know, I get all emotional about this because I walked alone by choice for so long in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, for so long. And a lot of times looking really good on the outside because I have character defects that, that make me look 
Like I'm together on the outside and people pat me on the head and tell me I'm doing a really good job and just keep going and I'm dying inside. You know? And we get so solution oriented here because we come in and we're a freaking mess of self pity and self destructiveness and self absorbed and self centered and all this stuff. And so we get like beaten into our heads. Solution, solution, solution. Get out of self pity. You know, what's the solution? And you know what? The truth for me is that I can get just as sick behind frantically searching for a solution as I can behind wallowing in self pity. That's what I've had. That's what I've learned about myself because I want the magic AA big book passage that's going to make my heart stop hurting when it's broken. And I want the step that's going to make me not have to grieve when someone I love has died. And I want this, you know, I want to know the right number of newcomers to work with so that I won't have to feel the pain. And the truth for me is that part of my AA story is sitting on my hands and feeling the feelings and having to learn how to do that. And it was hard. It was hard, and I cried a lot. And I was mad because I'm like, you know, I'm all, low. I, I can't talk about what's going on with me at t different times because it's not safe in AA. And I'm like running around and I'm like spiritually seeking. I'm like going to like these different spiritual places and I'm crying and I'm just like trying to find some relief, you know. And a lot of times the solution I got, my, I would call my sponsor and she'd be like, well, you pretty much just need to like feel that. And I'm like, Ah, oh, you know, and I would spend, and I would be like, and I'm like, oh, that is not what I want. And I, you know, I spent so much time sitting and smiling in meetings and people would come up to, you know, and sometimes I would open up and I would talk about, you know, in, in women's meetings, how frustrated I was or how much pain I was in. And, and people would come up to me and they'd say, God has a plan. <laughs> Or they bust out page 449 and I just wanted to punch them in the face because I was so mad. I was so mad because for me, part of my spiritual experience is like, I, I don't believe in a God that has a plan that, you know, things, you know, that everything in my life is orchestrated in this way where it's either like to teach me a lesson or reward me for something. Like it just, it, it doesn't work for me. And, um, but you know, they're trying to be kind and they're trying to be supportive. So I smile and say, thank you. But I really want to punch him in the face and because I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I'm hurting and I don't know how to deal with that. And I'm lonely. Um, you know, but you know, a sponsor told me I had to get honest about that stuff. You know, that I have sat in meetings with, you know, over a decade of sobriety wanting to punch people in the face because they're reading page 449 out of the big book. It's 417 in the fourth edition, if you're wondering. And, you know, because I just, sometimes I just felt like all I got was slogans and platitudes and this and that and all this stuff. And I just, it just didn't feel helpful to me, you know, but I was lucky enough that I, I opened up to these people and they, they pointed me in the right direction and they gave me other AA literature to read other than the big book. And they just let me be who I needed to be and be as frustrated as I needed to be with all of that. And, you know, and I've gotten to get through it and I've had, and I was pissed that I had to walk through it with grace and dignity. I did not want to walk through these difficult situations with grace and dignity. I really didn't. I wanted to make a giant mess out of the whole situation. Just like I saw other people doing. Why did I have to be the one who had to like inventory and to work and like all this stuff. And I'm like throwing these temper tantrums on the phone with my sponsor, like it tons of times sober. And I'm like, God, why is this so hard? And, um, you know, the, the, really what it comes down to is the truth for me is that when I think in terms of black and white, it does not work for me. Life for me has been messy and unpredictable and at times unfair and full of shades of gray. And no one solution or one tool or one thing that I've gotten out of my time sober is a solution for everything. I need to use different tools for different problems. Sometimes acceptance is the answer and sometimes action is the answer. And sometimes sitting on my hands and feeling my feelings is the answer. And sometimes seeking outside help is the answer. And I've had to do that in sobriety as well. And, um, you know, Okay, thanks. I have one minute. So, um, you know, I just, I felt like, and I was told by my sponsor, I shouldn't say I felt like I was told that I just had to really get honest about those things because I really want to be 
a good example to the new person in Alcoholics Anonymous. I really want to get up here and share a message of hope and strength because, you know, sobriety has been painful many, many times. And I didn't want to sound overly negative in sharing about these things because, you know, I have been sober. Tomorrow I will celebrate my 14 years of sobriety. And I have been sober three times as long as I got loaded. That is so much more life to experience and so many more opportunities to go through painful experiences than I, than I had. And that's what happens when you get sober young. And I didn't, um, you know, but the difference is I have had pain and sobriety and sometimes it has been worse than some of the pain that I experienced when I was loaded, but I have never been as hopeless as I was when I was drinking. I have never, ever felt that despair. I have felt pain but I know that I can be okay no matter what. And I know that I can be loved no matter what. And I did not have that drinking. And I absolutely would not trade my sober experience to go back out there. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Because throughout all of that messy, unpredictable, shades of gray life are moments of absolute joy and moments of absolute serenity. You know, it is a mixed bag. You know, that's what life is. It is a mixed bag. And whatever comes, I have the tools to be okay and walk through it, even if it doesn't look pretty. So um, I guess with that, I'll close. And thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Diana. Uh, next, we've got Miguel B. from San uh, Sherman Oaks, California. Sherman Oaks. Hi, I'm Miguel. I'm an alcoholic. Um, wow, that was strong. Uh, I felt you getting on a roll. Um, um, that part about um, either being the casualty or the cause. I was like, man. And everything after that, I was like, man, what? I have, I, I can. I cannot be more honest than that. I'll probably be a lot less honest, actually. Um, <laughs> and uh, a little more cerebral, because I really thought about what I wanted to say about this, because um, I, I have not necessarily a huge um, quantity of painful experiences, but a, a really high quality of painful experiences. <laughs> um, I um, I um, have been, um, next month I'll be sober 24 years. I got sober when I was 17. And... Um, and uh, by the way, um, great job hosting chairs, Aki. That was really great. That was our, I think, our first year bidding. Um, um, Civi Pa in the house? Anyone? Civi, Civi. Um, and uh, um, our, the program chair um, for the Wacky Paw uh, uh, called me last week and asked me if I could fill in. I, I offered um, to fill in for any any panel. So, uh, she said, have you ever experienced any pain? So I kind of was like, yeah. And so like, I'm, you know, um, I would say in general for someone who has, um, lived as, um, um, to the age of 41 or been sober a long time or drank or, you know, anyone really, um, I would say that I maybe have experienced, I feel like I've experienced less. I feel like I'm, I think I'm trying to just disclaim a little bit like I'm, um, but, um, but I, I have one, generally one qualifying experience. Um, and it didn't come until I had 19 years sober. And it was by far um, the, the single most utterly transformative experience of my life. And it was not a death. It was not a death. Um, it was a breakup. You know, it was a breakup. And it had come as a result of becoming um, completely... Um, a, um, desperately uh, attached to another alcoholic, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have, uh, obviously, I don't have anyone else's pain to compare it against, only my pr experience up to that point and my experience since then. Um, but I, I thought I, I would come and talk about that. Um, you know, it's said that alcoholics only hate two things, um, the way things are right now, and, and change. <laughs> and, and pain uh, is described as the touchstone of all spiritual progress. And I actually looked up touchstone. It did not mean what I thought it meant. 
Um, and um, I'm still not sure what it means. But uh, um, it's, um, it's something to, to measure other things against. It's from actually from alchemy. Um, but, um, you know, my, um, my sort of my spiritual w- sort of waking up process, I, don't, um, I would never describe myself as being awake or fully awake, but just still continuing to wake up. Um, mine has been absolutely of the educational variety, and um, w- when it comes to change, um, I definitely fit in the sometimes slowly category. Um, I um, and part of my um, part of my experience in growing up in AA, because a, my AA life uh, to me seems the only normal one. Um, is um, that um, whether I've been actively treating or not treating my alcoholism, uh, regardless, um, um, I become more sensitive, not less sensitive, as time goes by. And um, when that really um, excruciatingly painful thing happened to me, um, I got to, I had, um, I had no real way of, of numbing, of checking out, of of trying to um, ease that pain. There was no friendly direction I could turn. There was no comfortable sort of emotional or mental position that I could contort myself into to lessen that pain. It was uh, sheer misery and sheer agony. And um, it made me willing to either do things that I hadn't been willing up to do up until that point or hadn't been willing to do um, in, for a really long time. Um, and I had become much more deliberate at that point about the inventory process. And um, I w- got to really remind myself, um, and I got to check this against a lot of the inventory I wrote about this experience, um, and I was not able to find an instant um, where um, this statement was not true, that I had, um, um, that this person hurt me seemingly without provocation, but I found that invariably at some point in the past, I had put myself in a position to be hurt. And one of the things that I had learned um, from that, um, one of the things I had learned from that experience was um, to, um, um, to avoid the deliberate um, manufacture of my own misery because I was able to look back and see how I had done that how I had essentially made this other person my higher power and that I had relied, was relying utterly on this person um, absolutely for my self-worth. Um, and um, this, um, this, it got to the point where this relationship um, gave my life its meaning absolutely. And so when that ended, my life had no meaning. And um, on the outside, um, it looked... Like my house and I and my home looked like a junkie and a junkie's home, and um, um, the the lack of sleep um, on the on the daily basis and this this went on for months. Um, um, trying to get some sleep during the day, not eating. I lost maybe 20 pounds, 25 pounds. Um, isolation, you know. Um, um, the the loneliness and the isolation, um, and then um, th- so the the you know skinny pale the bags under the eyes. This is with 19 years sober. Um, the the dishes with the the you know the ants and the flies, the laundry, the bills. I mean, you know what I mean. It was just like um, it was um, that that apartment was such a, a perfect picture of my internal my thought life. You know, it was like. Um, it, they matched absolutely, and um, um, you know I had um, not been really that deliberate about um, a meditation practice up until that point, and um, it had not been since I was a teenager that I had done anything um, resembling um, like getting outside help. Um, I never considered getting a prescription. For anything, I've never been prescribed anything in sobriety. Uh, I don't have an opinion about that, actually, one way or another. But um, that actually never occurred to me. Um, although I feel like in my emotional state, it might have been. I, I don't think I could have had trouble finding a doctor who would have um, happily prescribed me something or another. Um, 
But, um, you know, my, um, it was sort of hanging on a thread and my, my AA life has always been set up and, and what was at the time set up so that, um, God damn it, I had to show up when I really, really didn't want to. You know, it was a really good example of having a couple of commitments and a couple of sponsees and a couple of pretty regular friendships and sort of what I call that first, sort of the inner circle of friends, um, that, um, turned out to be utterly unavoidable and um you know in 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 sort of that a that early aa training that that pedigree of you know having commitments um in the simplest ways that i look at it was so that i would show up when i really didn't want to or when it was absolutely the last thing i wanted to do so there was these um these little um little bright spots these little bright points of light um from moment to moment where i was able to get I wouldn't say completely out of self, but just, just, um, you know, um, a little bit of, of an idea that, um, that it was going to pass, that, that it wasn't permanent, you know, just like the relationship wasn't permanent. Um, so, um, I, um, I started going to therapy and, um, I started going to meditation classes and, um, I went to therapy for a couple of years um, to, um, and really, I think a lot of the um, um, investigating a, um, for the most part, in my experience, meant um, just a more of a, a closer look of ultimately what it was that was going to end up in inventory and what I was the, what I was going to humbly ask to be removed. You know, so it was like it was all sort of extracurricular, but eventually it came back. To really the most um, the most powerful tools I have for um, sort of living in this what I call the human experience, being able to navigate and um, and and um, be a part of the human race um, while um, not creating any new wreckage and um, trying to do as little harm to myself and other people as possible. Um, and you know, eventually. I, I would describe it as having gone into sort of this cocoon state, you know, where I had sh um, shut down in almost every way possible and um, um, was just, you know, beginning to sort of understand um, the difference between um, pain and suffering, um, where I, I um, learned, especially through... Um, inventory and amends, the amends process, um, um, where it was that, um, I could sort of experience these injuries, um, without, um, sort of exacerbating them. Um, and, um, but, and, and not continuing to live in that resentment where I hold my attention in those painful moments and walk around seemingly a member of the human race, but constantly, you know, emotionally, spiritually, stuck in that moment, you know, that moment of that sheer agonizing terror when I realized that, that, that she was leaving and that she wasn't coming back. Um, and when I mentioned the, the fact that I get more sensitive over time, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of times the, when the word sensitive is used, I know especially early on in my recovery, um, sensitivity um, is referred to as a defect, um, but it's really my reaction, my you know, to hold my burden of pain skillfully that makes um, being sensitive a defect. Um, I um, I absolutely see being sensitive today as an asset because um, um, you know basically the you know. My, my experience, um, you know, my life, completely my life experience, um, is 1% what happens and 99% how I react to it. And, um, um, continuing to be more deliberate about steps of 10, 11, and 12, meditation and, and some of the work that I got through in therapy has given me, um, a completely new set of actions and behaviors and reactions and perceptions to the world and people and to myself. Um, 
And, you know, that experience, you know, at 19 years sober, I'm 30, um, at the time I was, you know, 36. Um, obviously I'd, I had plenty of years to act out and make a lot of other mistakes in relationships. Um, n- none of them obviously, um, um, as painful or transformative as the one I'm describing, but, um, by the time I had gotten into that relationship, of course, I had already built up a lot of armor around my heart. And, um, and that experience <laughs> basically just knocked it down. It, it's, it just left me raw. And, um, and, uh, it, and it never occurred to me, I, I don't remember thinking, I will never love again. I don't remember thinking um, that um, um, that I should just be alone forever. I, I may have thought that. I don't remember thinking it. Um, but in in part of um, waking up out of that cocoon and sort of coming out, um, what ended up happening was um, because I had decided at some point that this was going to be a transformative experience. And also realizing and deciding that I didn't have to go through it alone, which I really thank you for mentioning, never having to do anything alone. Um, that I had, I emerged, um, you know, this didn't happen automatically. This, this took some deliberate effort on my part, but eventually I did emerge, um, the happiest, most inspired, most useful <laughs> version of myself that I've ever been. And I'm actually more active in Alcoholics Anonymous now than, than I've ever been. <laughs> Janie, you're killing me. Uh, she's crying. Um, yeah, we got tissues up here. Um, um, does anyone else here not have a lot? I'm like, I have total cotton mouth right now, yeah. Um So, my attitude about love um, um, is pretty much in keeping with um, the description of, of uh, one of the descriptions of love in the prophet, which is, um, if out of your fear you only seek love's peace and love's pleasure, um, then it would be good for you to cover your nakedness and pass um, out of love's threshing floor into a seasonless world, thank you, where you will laugh, but not all of your laughter, and you will weep, but not all of your tears. Um, I um, One of the things that, that comes up in, <laughs> in Buddhist practice is that life is, is, is 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows, you know, and um, that my suffering basically revolves around how much I resist the suffering, the, how much I resist pain, and how much I cling on to joy and pleasure. Um, another thing that became a very large part of my life, my just my human experience, my spiritual practice, whatever you want to call it, um, is a lot of um, um, deliberate action and thought in regards to forgiveness. Um, and forgiveness is not mentioned a lot um, in our literature. Um, I actually um, I searched for pain um, in my um, um, one one day at a time app. It's actually the word pain is not actually in the big book. It's really interesting. Um, it's mentioned a lot in the twelve and twelve. Um, but um. You know, I um, I think that I caught, gave myself a really hard time. I know that your description of, of feeling like um, sort of the difficulty with not being able to find that perfect passage in the big book to provide that instant relief. Um, I um, I think I sometimes um, have tried to force and rush the healing process and say that I forgave when I didn't, you know, um, and that there was a, some um, 
um, a, a sort of um, a, a fear. I think sometimes I operated out of a fear of not appearing to be really spiritual, you know, and wanting to put on that face that that I I forgave when I was actually still um, in in resentment, con- continuing to revisit those old injuries um, and sort of keep them open. Um, so I hadn't really done the work necessary to to allow healing to begin, and yet I was still saying that I forgave and that it was all good, you know. Um, one of the things that goes with sort of how my uh, ism, my defects manifest, um, is um, as I've had a hard time, um, not that hard, but um, a hard time learning how to um, receive with grace, um, I also um, somehow managed to easily glance over, which I think a lot of us do, um, the part of the book um, in the fifth step that says, we asked for his forgiveness. And, uh, you know, I think that my reaction to that was that, um, that ask, having to ask for his forgiveness, um, required that I first have a judge in God. Um, but I think that as with a lot of the work that I do in prayer, um, it's not so much, um, what God's experience with my prayers are going to be. It's what my experience with my prayers are going to be, you know, uh, the, the making that demonstration of willingness and humility and gratitude. You know, for me, that's where a lot of the, a lot of the change and the healing happens, um, is in just making those demonstrations. Um, I get on my knees, um, just for the sole purpose. I mean, I can describe, I think I've been able to describe a lot, um, <laughs> why I get on my knees when I pray, um, to sort of, um, I, I think as a, to, to, as a rebuttal to the naysayers, to, to knee praying, <laughs> but, um, um, but really that's, that's, that's when that resonated with me the most was that it was a demonstration, merely a demonstration of humility and gratitude. Um, so, um, so being able to, <laughs> how much time do I have? Um, Our, um, our, our literature has, um, another, in the big book, there's a, a description of, um, basically what uh, Joe and Charlie describe as being reborn. And, um, it's only been through my, uh, my pain and my suffering, um, that I've experienced anything like is described in the book. And it's, uh, I don't know what page it on. It's, uh, um, ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were once the guiding forces of these men were at once cast out and a whole new set of conceptions, uh, concepts and motives began to dominate. And, um, you know, I've set these really high ideals um, um, for um, what I want sort of this new life to be like for me, um, having sort of what I felt like having emerged from sort of that cocoon state and I believe that, um, you know, and these are just ideals. I'm just trying to grow along these lines. But I believe that, you know, on a spiritual path, one thing that we can anticipate is to be reborn, um, to sort of um, return to sort of like a childlike state where we can love with a completely open and undefended heart, um, where forgiveness isn't necessary because I have no armor for you to damage um, where tolerance isn't necessary because I don't find fault with anything, where resistance isn't necessary because I give my attention only to what is wanted, um, where injury um, is allowed to be felt and heal completely, not revisited and reopened time and again, um, and where we can um, acquire um, and recover the faith of a child where we have no idea what is not possible. Um, and um, that was only possible through the suffering um, and the pain that I've experienced. So thanks for letting me share.
Thank you very much, Miguel. And uh, finally, please help me welcome our last speaker, Danielle B. from Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> Kenya's in Africa. It's been I've been asked that many times. So um, my name's Danielle, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you guys so much um, for you know speaking. Um, I. Uh, I'm going to be really quick about a couple of things. I um, I came into this meeting, and beforehand, I had called my mother, who was a dry drunk, and uh, I mean, that's all I need to say about that. Like, you know, <laughs> but that's another day, another meeting, another phone call. Um, but uh, I on Thursday, I'll have 13 years sober, and um, I don't have a Kenyan accent. I'm American. If you were wondering. I'm quite tan, though, actually. <laughs> I'm really, really tan. Um, um, so I had my first drink when I was four, and I'm not really going to do a drunk log, but I, you know, obviously I'm not call it because I'm here. Um, but I had my first drink when I was four, and it was Clue and Milk, and I had a song and dance about it, and my family thought it was cute and funny. Um, when I was, I don't know, in seventh grade, I started school young, so I don't really know the ages. And seventh grade, I dressed up as a baby for Halloween so I could put vodka in my bottle at school, and I thought that that was normal. Um, at 21, I went and backpacked to Europe, and I married my drug dealer from another country and brought him home. So, you know, I think I qualify. Um, but, you know, today, um, and if you want to hear more about any of those stories, I totally will talk to you about it later, but, um, you know, today I was asked to speak on pain, and... Um, for me, it was physical pain. And, um, you know, I had a five-hour car ride. I, I've been back in the country about a week now. And, um, and, um, I had a five-hour car ride. And, uh, the whole car ride was like, well, what is your story gonna be? And I was like, oh. like I don't, I don't wanna, I don't always like to tell it. I, I, I try to make sure that it doesn't, it's not who I am. And that's a really hard thing. Um, so I was, uh, four years sober. And I had my dream job, and I worked in a TV show, and I got to travel, and I got paid, and I hurt myself. And I, uh, you know, I, uh, I couldn't put my shoes on. And, um, you know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't pull up my pants. And, uh, I was like, oh, it's like a sprained ankle. It's totally fine. Like, nothing's wrong. And, um, and I went back to work. And, um, you know, uh, you know, we don't, people, uh, these are my opinions and this is my experience. And I'm going to talk about medication and I'm going to talk about drugs that I had to use. Um, and they were doctor prescribed and it was the hardest thing. And, um, you know, I, uh, so I hurt my spine and, and, and I met these ladies in the bathroom today right after I had the phone call and I was crying and they're in the stall next to me discussing going to this panel. And so I was like, I'm like, why do you, why do you want to go to the, the pain and recovery panel? <laughs> and I, and she was like, oh, well, um, uh, because, and I was like, why? What, what do you want to hear? Physical or mental pain? Like, like it's pain. What does it matter? Right? And, and you know, and, and she gave me the right answer and I kind of needed to hear that. And I, and, and she's like, oh, back pain. And I was like, oh, well, you should come. I'm the speaker. I'm one of them. She's like, what are you going to speak on? I'm like, I have to wait and find out. And, um, you know, um, <laughs> so I, um, I spent four years in, um, being in pain, um, seeing doctor after doctor after surgeon after doctor. And I did every kind of, Body therapy, mental therapy. I tried to see the white light. It was like, whatever, I'll go to a healer. And, um, I didn't want to have the surgery. And in the meantime, I was not able to walk. And I was bedridden. And, uh, I was prescribed Darmacet. And I, I, when I was using, I smoked a lot of pot and shrooms and took anything that you would put in my hand. <laughs> However, I'd never used cocaine because those people were bad. <laughs> It makes sense to me, but that's okay. I mean, you know. And um, so I, I got my um, medication, and I took it home, and I opened it, and it was hot pink. I was like, that's awesome. This is not good. And I went to a meeting, and I took the pills with me. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck to do. Like, this is doctor prescribed. I talked to my sponsor. Like, I can't walk. I can't sit in the meeting. I'm laying on the floor. 
but but everyone talks about not taking medication in the meeting, so I'm really confused, and I have I don't I don't want to go out, so like what do you do? And so I started going to home meetings, <clears throat> and um, I'm originally from Los Angeles, and um, so I would go to meetings where I could lay on people's floors, and then I would go to big meetings on a Friday night in Rodeo, and I would lay on the floor, and I didn't really care, and um, you know whatever I was getting sober, and um, you know. Um, I had to take medication, and it kind of fucks with your head a little bit. Um, and uh, then I had to have surgery. So I had a double spinal fusion, and I have lots of rods and screws and cages at my back. Um, but let me let me preface. Uh, okay, prior to the surgery, I um, I didn't know how to do nothing in my life. And um, so I sort of was like, you know, would call my sponsor and was like, if God's trying to send the message, like, I got it. You know, I get the message. Whatever the fuck it is, I got it. And she was like, okay. You know, and um, and she was like, "Why don't you just, you know, do nothing?" And I was like, "I don't know, how, I don't know what that is." You know, and and um, Friday nights with me were like having dinner in my bed with my friends because I couldn't do anything, I couldn't really sit in a car, I couldn't sit through a movie, and um, and nobody wants to hear that you're in pain all the time because it's kind of a downer. And the reality is, is like they ask you like, "How are you doing?" No one really wants to hear. It fucking hurts today. No, nobody really wants to hear that. And so when you answer that, they're like. Like, oh, sorry to ask, you know. And it's like, um, you know, I, I lost a lot of friends. Because um, I was also, you get a little irritated and angry when you're in pain. And, um, you know, I try my best. Um, oh, the stage is, like, creaking and it's scaring me. Because for me, the reality is, is, like, if I fall, I might not get back up. And it's scary. Like, things like that freak me out now. Car, car driving in cars, being rear-ended, I'm like, oh, my God, please, please don't hit me. Like, I just, I don't want to go to the hospital again. Um, so, uh, it, you know, anyways. So, uh, okay, so while I was in pain, bedridden, <clears throat> my brightest outlook was to not be in a wheelchair and to not be like an 80-year-old man. And that's what they told me. And I was like, well, that doesn't work for me. I'm going to see a different doctor. And they all said the same thing. And I just kept saying, well, that's that's not what my life is. I'm not even 30. You know, I have a whole life and I want to do things. And um, a friend in the program said, well, you could go to school. You never finished school. And I was like, well, I don't have any money. So I went and I got, I don't know, I don't know, whatever. I got like nine units paid for. So I started putting myself to school for the through the government or something. I don't know what it's called. And um, I don't know. You like fill out a paper that you don't make any money and you get like so many credits, all right? So, um, and I thought I was stupid. And I thought that smart people got A's. Well, really smart people go to class. <laughs> you know, I was the kid that like wore like I love THC and sat in the front row and I was like, what up teacher? Like, you know, I was so rude. Um, I, I still think it's funny though. Um, uh, you know, um, so, uh, so I, I started going to school and I, and I took like a class and then another class and I got an A and then I got another A and I was like, wow. Wow, if I do my homework, so if I, it's like, just like, you know, you hear these stories of like people like, I went to school, like they sit in the meeting, you sit in the front, you show up early, you do your homework, whatever. I ended up getting a scholarship and I went to UCLA. And in the middle of my finals, my uh, insurance approved my surgery. And I was like, oh, it's October. It doesn't, you know, I waited for in something years. And, um, and I had surgery and my teachers came to visit me in the hospital. And the hospital was not fun. And it was the most terrific experience I've ever had. And um, I had a lung infection. And so they cut me from my belly button down in my front and my back. And when I got out of, the, when I got out of like recovery, I don't know, a few hours later, they dropped something on my stomach. And I screamed. And I was like, do not touch me. And she was like, what is the problem? I was like, don't touch me. Like, just, are you fucking kidding me? And, you know, my sponsor came every day. And my meetings came to me. And I was, you know, on a drip medication because I didn't have a choice. And I would fight it and argue. And I was loaded in the hospital. And, you know, it's uncomfortable to say that because at the same time, I'm like, is this a slip? Is it not a slip? But it's medical, but it's prescribed. And she's like, you've been out of surgery 10 hours. I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm freaking out, you know. And, and um, you know, and we have other pain. And, you know, the day I went to surgery, the woman, um, the woman who, who I had, the whole meeting with every week. She died the morning I had my surgery. And they didn't want to tell me. And so I was like, why isn't she here? 
where is she? And it took them three days, and they didn't know how to tell me. And um, and they kind of kept coming, but like she wasn't there. Like I, I had a this meeting, and and um, so they sort of were like, well, you know, I got a phone call. And he's like, has anyone talked to you? And I was like, no. And he said, you know, Melinda died. And um, you know, the nurse looked at me and she said, you know, just put a pillow on your belly, and it won't hurt when you cry. I was like, wow, you know. Like, you know, and um, and I say that she had um. She was, um, had 20 something years of sobriety and had, um, ovarian cancer for 19 years. And she'd always say, I'd had it for 19 years and I'd been married three times and traveled the world. And I was like, I can do that. I can do that. If you can do that, I can do that. And, um, you know, so I, um, I had surgery and I ended up, you know, I, uh, I could only miss so much of school and I showed up at school with a pillow and I had to wear these bone stimulators and I sat in class. And, um, you know, and I went to meetings and I would shake and I couldn't really last an hour in a chair. I just couldn't do it. And, um, you know, uh, you know, pain kind of sucks. And the thing is, is that I didn't have a disease and I wasn't dying and I didn't look like I had a problem. I looked normal and I looked fine. Sometimes I waddled and sometimes like I still, after I, after I sit a while, I just kind of get up and I like, I kind of walk like a pregnant lady that's like going to have a baby right away. And it's like this weird thing and, and it's just uncomfortable. And, um, and I don't like to talk about it. And, um, you know, relationships are really tough and, and who wants to date, you know, the handicapped girl and, you know, who wants to, you know, some days are good and some days are bad. I have more really good days actually. Um, cause now I can go to Kenya and not be worried like how awful the hospital is in case I have to go. Um, those are the things that you think about or I think about, um, but, you know, I, um, I went to school and I finished it. And, um, you know, my pain got different. And, um, you know, my, uh, my sponsor had to give me a sponge bath in the hospital one day. And I was like, wow, I don't think I'd ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, they just took care of me. And, um, you know, they washed my hair. And, and it wasn't that I was a newcomer and I wasn't using, but I needed help. And I also had to ask for help. And those are sort of the things that I learned is like asking for like when someone's like, can I carry that? Yes, you may, because it's too heavy for me and I can't carry my gallon of milk, you know, and um, and it's not that I'm weak or that I'm, you know, sissy and a girl and want a guy to do it for me. It's like, no, it's the end of the day and it just fucking hurts, um, you know. So my doctor said I every time. So I have like two minutes. Um. So I graduated college. I got there on a university, on a scholarship for good grades because apparently I'm smart when I go to school. And, um, I went and studied in Bulgaria and I got these opportunities to like, you know, to go and, and, um, I would just mentally tell my body that, you know, you can be in pain later. And, uh, sometimes it's really hard for people this happened actually a couple months ago. I was in South Africa and I don't know, they were moving us upstairs and I was like, well, I'm not going to stay upstairs because I can't carry my bags up there. And they're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and this girl just gave me this attitude and I said, you know, it's uncomfortable. And, it, you know, I just, I have to speak up. And, um, you know, for me, it's such a, you know, it's such a, it's such a weird thing. It's a weird experience to, um, have pain in your body. And, um, you know, I, I obviously, I no longer take medication and, uh, I just don't, I don't need it. I have aspirin or Advil or whatever. Um, but I try to just, you know, I exercise and I do what they told me, but, um, you know, I've been sleeping on these couches in these rooms. Fucking my back hurts. I'm tired, you know, <laughs> but it's okay. And I'm here and I'm sober. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about like how I got to Kenya um, and sobriety there. And, um, it's pretty amazing that, you know, uh, I spent all this time and I, I was like, I have chronic pain. And my doctor's like, you don't have chronic pain. You had pain. I wanted to be the victim. I, I didn't know, you know, for, you know, six, seven years of my life, that's what, how I was, um, I don't know the word now, but not described, but like, yeah, I was defined by it, and I let it define me. And, um, you know, I, I, whenever I go out of the country, I go and see my surgeon, and we just do a little MRI, and I make sure I feel okay, and I get insurance to be airlifted, and, uh, 
And uh, I was like, oh, I think you have to sign this paper that says I have chronic pain. He's like, you, you don't have chronic anything. I was like, oh. But I still have pain some days. He's like, but it's not chronic. You're okay. And I just needed, like, a medical professional to say, you're okay. Like, you know, it's all right. And, um, you know, after I had the surgery and I got out of the hospital, um, it, and I had a blood transfusion and I had an, oh, I got to have an ultrasound on my heart. It was really cool. Um, cause they thought I had a, <laughs> they thought I had a hole in my heart because every time the guy that I was dating would come and see me, my heart was racing cause he was driving me crazy in the hospital because I was like, can I have some cr- cranberry juice? No, can I have water? I need ice. He's like, what do you want? Make up your mind. I was like, I don't, I'm like hooked up to all these machines. Like, I don't know what the fuck I want, you know, give me ice. Like, I don't know. And uh, so my heart rate kept going up and they were like, something's wrong with your heart. And I was like, no. So I had to tell a sponsor that he's not allowed to come and see me anymore. We had dated three years. It was not a new relationship. So, um, (laughs) but um, when I got out of the hospital, you know, it was a really horrific experience. And I said to my my doctor, I said, "Um, why didn't you tell me how bad it was going to be? And he said, you'd never have done it. And I said, you're right. I, I wouldn't have done it. Um, you know, I kind of left and was like, I don't want to have children because that, that's just, oh, you know, and, and a year later I had to go back in and have the screws removed. Um, and so they just take them right back out your muscle. And I was like, I mean, we're like in 2000 and what, like, that's the way you're, you know, they just redrill them back out. And, um, so I was then back again, like back another year and your recovery is like a year for each surgery. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, it just was what it was. And I kind of lived in sweats and, you know, I'd go on dates. I'd be like, is it okay if I wear my sweats today? Because I can't, it's really uncomfortable to wear like a belt, even though I have jeans on today. Normally it's kind of painful. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, uh, about two years ago, I moved to New York, to Manhattan. And, um, and I absolutely love it. And it's just something I'd always wanted to do. And, you know, um, my mom has leukemia, and my brother-in-law has lymphoma, and they're all, like, 24 years sober. And, you know, so I've experienced those types of pain. And when he was going through chemo, I had just gotten out of surgery. We both had all these things hooked up to us, and so we would just, we stayed at my sister, we would just wander, like, at night with, like, you know, these, like, I'm on my second set of clothes because I'm sweating because I'm detoxing. And, you know, they give you a lot of stuff that they don't tell you about when you're in the hospital, just, just so you know, forewarn. They gave me a lot of things that I did not ask for, nor did I want. Um, you all heard that, right? It's not just me. <laughs> okay. So anyways, um, so I moved to New York and I loved it. And, you know, I do costumes and they told me that I had to pick a new career. And, and I said, well, that's the only career that I, that I love and I want to do. And that's what I'm passionate about. And, um, and I stuck with it and, um, I, it's trouble. It's hard. Like, it's hard for me to move my machine and I get tired, but you know, I'm not dying. I'm not dying of this. And uh, I get to go to Africa, and I get to live in Africa, and I get to go to meetings. And um, there's, like, way too many white people here. I keep telling people that, and they don't understand. Like, it's, like, way too many white people for me. I'm very like, confused. <laughs> it's, like, it's really weird. Like, you don't understand. Like, I never met a white person that was sober in Kenya. I was the only white person. And it sounds racist to say that, but that's just what, what we say. So um, it's not when you're there. Um, and uh, <laughs> sounds weird. I also also went to the Young People's Convention in South Africa. And, um, you know, it's one day. And they had maybe um, 100 or so people. And we had four people from international. We had a girl from Ireland and um, Swaziland, which is the country a little country next to South Africa. Little bitty. Um, the president's like 40 and he has like 16 wives. He has like a mustache. He looks like a porn star. It's really funny. He's on all their bills. I'm uh, sorry. I mean, it's totally, you know, outside issue, but you know, whatever. Um, but you know, I, I got to go to these meetings and what happened was, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of us that live abroad. And, um, if you guys travel, I've been to meetings in, um, you know, Paris and Vienna and, and Stockholm and the, the Swedish um, fellowship is really amazing. But, you know, um, when you have these time differences, no one in America is awake when you're awake. So it's 10 hours. So your sponsor's not available. So you have to get online and Skype and they have Skype meetings. 
um, with people that you just put on a post that like you want to have a meeting at you know noon on Tuesday or something. Hopefully in the right time zone. I always fuck them up. But um, you know, and I had these meetings and these people would say, Hey, I know this guy that's in Uganda. How far are you? I'm like, I'm a 12 hour bus ride, but that's okay. It's like you know, we go to any links. I did not go there um, because the gorillas are there and I really want to see them and it's kind of expensive and. I knew I would spend the money and I don't really want to spend any more money. So, but you know, I did go to South Africa and I flew and, and, um, and, uh, we both know someone from Swaziland. So we talked about that and what a small world that I come here. But, um, you know, we're alcoholics and we're all the same. And, um, you know, it's really great to get on those, you know, their Facebook groups and, and different things and, and to chat with those people because they come here too. And, you know, we, we all think that we know each other and everyone knows everyone. And, oh, you're from this country. So you might have, must have 20 people, but you know, um, Sobriety is really young in other places. And, you know, someone that has 10 years is an old timer. And, um, you know, we forget how easy it is. And growing up in Los Angeles, you know, there's 3,000 meetings a week. You know, in Nairobi, you don't go out after dark. So I could only go to noon meetings, but I work. So you're sort of, you know, and you can only go to certain ones because otherwise they're kind of dangerous and whatever. But, um, you know, and, uh, but, you know, going to meetings in South Africa and, and um, you know, it was just really awesome. And we're everywhere. And, you know, um, I think for me, um, I have to look at my pain as a blessing. And, um, and it wasn't easy. And it's not easy. And, um, you know, I had to take, you know, talking about the medication thing is really tricky because a lot of people have opinions. And I'm like, well, do you have to take medication? They go, no. I go, well, then I don't. You know, you don't have that experience. You know, it's the same thing about other things in the program, and um, I can just speak from my experience. But I also called my sponsor on it, and it was a whole regimen, and we had to write everything down every time I wanted to take pain medicine. It was not like, I can just like, oh, yeah, I'm good. It was like, no, no, no. What's your pain level? And um, I um, fought it for a really long time, and I was in Whole Foods in, I don't know, should we go? No. Riverside? Riverside? In cold water? I blacked out on the floor because I refused to take my pain medicine out of the hospital that day. And it's like, you know, she's like, honey, you're on the floor. I was like, I don't want to use, I don't want to lose my sobriety date. And she's like, what, what, you can't, what, you know, what, this is not sobriety at the same time. <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, but I don't, you know, and, and the, the flip side was that um, I would get rushed to the hospital a lot. I'd be on a date, really great date at the beach. We'd walk it in the sand and be like, I, I'm, I, you got you got to take me to the hospital. Like I can't move anymore. And um, yeah, that's a good date. Handicap sex. Oh, it's awesome. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So um, and they would give me shots of morphine, and I was like, yeah. And then I was like, oh fuck. Like it's this is really like for this moment of like, yeah, I get an excuse to get high. And then I was like, no, no, I don't really want that because I really want to be sober. And um, you know. It's hard to talk about it and to be honest about it. And um, it's such a slippery slope. And I know a lot of people go out on medication, and um, and I understand it. And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's so easy. It's just, you know, I don't understand why you're always, you know, people are slipping or, you know, it's debilitating um, being in pain. Or for me, it was. And, um, you know, I think I have a couple more minutes, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up. But, um, you know, I um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I've been here since I was about 13. My sister got sober, and she's a few years older than me. And, um, you know, it's kind of all I know, and it's where I'm comfortable. And um, I think if it wasn't about me speaking up at meetings and saying, like, I have to take medication, and I don't care what your opinion is, like, you know, but I have to take it, and I'm going to sleep on this floor, and I'm in the Palisades in Malibu at this fancy meeting. I'm like, you got a pillow? Because I need to lay down. Like, you know, it was just sort of a funny thing. And then that's kind of how I got to know people. And, you know, the flip side was that, um, you know, a lot of people also offered their opinion. of like, oh, you should see my doctor. I'd go, great, dude, do you want to pay for it? And they'd go, oh, um, um, well, and I'd go, okay, then. You know, because it was like, I understand what worked for you, but if we went around to every alcoholic and, you know, was like, oh, you should come to my meeting. Have you been to my meeting? Have you tried my meeting? You know, it's like, maybe, I don't know, but it doesn't work for me, you know? It's like, um, you know, it's sort of, um, so it's good to be here. Um, it's, it's a trip for me to be in a meeting, and um, 
I don't really like, it's not that I don't like it, but I don't talk about my pain very often. And, um, you know, I've had really, uh, it's funny, we laugh because I talk about handicapped sex and it's really funny. And the flip side is, is that sometimes it's really painful. And guys do not like that. And I've had some really awful things said to me. And, um, where it was sort of like, you know, well, if you're going to be in pain like this, you know, I don't really want to date you. If you're not going to be 100%, you know, I don't think we have a future. And, um, those are really hard things to hear. And, um, I just sort of like, you know, that's not the person for me. Um, cause this is my life. And, um, I do the best that I can. And, um, you know, it's funny and it's just sad. And these are sober members of alcoholics too. Let me just let me point that out. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, um, what else can I say? I don't know. You can talk to me after if you have any other questions. Um, you know, I think you can get through it. And it's not easy. And, but nothing is really, right? I don't know. Getting sober wasn't easy. It wasn't for me. I should say that. I'll just speak for myself. It wasn't for me, but, you know, um, I got to go to college. I got to study in other countries. I live in Africa. That would have never happened if I wouldn't have been injured and had to have all the surgery. It was not my plan. So I just, you know, I thank God for the opportunity. And, you know, I kind of live my life as that um, we live one life, and I'm going to live it. And um, I'm just going to live it to the fullest. And, um, you know, that's sort of what I was put here to do. So thanks so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.